With his paintings, Richard Phillips is a master of seduction. He plays upon the complex web of human obsessions with sexuality, politics, power, and death. He uses a classical painterly technique to make things and people you have seen before look and feel unfamiliar and mean something different. Our conversation covered the first art car to win at Lamaze, what it feels like to unintentionally make a lot of people really mad, Gossip Girl, and what can stand in the way of love. What did you do today? Today, I did not go to my studio because I knew that getting here would be a priority. So I, I tried to limit the amount of things that I did. Um, uh, what did I do? I just was at home. I there Today, um, I was reading. I did a bit of reading today. Um, I was reading this book of philosophy by this Korean um, philosopher who lives in Berlin. His name is Byung uh, uh, Chul Han. And uh, it's a book called uh, Agony of Eros, which I highly recommend for everyone. It's a only, it's a very slim, it's only like 54 pages or something like that. But it's probably one of the most important books that I've read in some time about contemporary ideas. So, so, so I read that and then I was also watching the um, big wave uh, uh, surfing championship in Maui called, uh, uh, which um, a friend of mine who I, met in Nicaragua surfing, um, was competing, and uh, I was literally watching on my iPad him win his round, of the first round of surfing in 50-foot high waves, which was unbelievable. <laughs> so, I want to ask about the book. Mm -hmm. 54 pages yeah. can, can sound really short, mm -hmm. um, but 54 pages of something that's really complicated can also feel really long. So... It's very well, it's, it's, yes, it's quite dense, but it's also very readable, you know, because it, um, it tackles the, our, the subject, uh, you know, of our time, which is this kind of, which um, Han refers to as this kind of inferno of the same, you know, which is this idea that the uh, that, um, contemporary society and social media is eradicating the idea of the other, which is necessary for love in, in essence and so the agony of eros refers to the fact that the pressure of contemporary society is um, eradicating that notion of the other making it impossible for people other to exist other than in this um, self-contained um, uh, position and that where they are uh, enslaving themselves to self-promotion and it's something that they feel good about feel good about doing so it's a kind of um way that the totality of the people's experience is about um, training themselves to become a better consumer. And the idea is that it makes love impossible? Yes. Yeah, it, it does. It, me it means that because rather than reliving, one, like losing oneself in the other and then having that and then finding themselves in the other, it's the eradication of the other and then it becomes like the... Uh, sameness of the self, you know, and that it's becomes, uh, and that lends to um, being a more perfect uh, consumer because it's only about self-obsession self, um, and reference, you know, and that lends to the uh, manifestation of how social media um, creates this kind of uh, panopticon around the individual, which leads to, you know, um, a not necessarily a positive outlook. But what he offers as a antidote to that is this kind of uh, breaking through that um, that idea and and actually taking risks on on love itself and, and through the other. So it's it's a great book, and I totally recommend it. I'm not doing a, it justice, but there's he sees it through you know politics and um, and interpersonal relationships and all that. So in only 54 pages. So. <laughs> So there are tons of arguments, I guess, uh, against social media, mm -hmm. um, but potentially the most impactful might be the idea of um, the eradication of love, because I think that's a core human need. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, it really comes down to um, the way in which uh, people are you are like twenty four seven engaged in this self promotion and becoming a, like their own commercial vehicle. And typically, when we think of exploitation, there's there's like um, allo exploitation, which is outside the person, who's like a force outside of you. But then there's auto exploitation, which is the self exploiting the self, and then thinking that they're um, doing well by doing that. And uh, it's more a protective way of being that um, doesn't take as many risks. And and so in that sense, you know, it was it was interesting to read that and see these guys like throwing themselves over the ledge of these 50 foot waves because, in essence, they're the freedom that involves when confronting death on that level is um, is extraordinary. I mean, and then what they propose as their model, which is to you know, throw themselves into the void um, in a very real sense, um, becomes the most spectacular antidote to exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, so I was thinking about your work today mm -hmm. um, on the way here, and, and I wanted to actually ask you about risk taking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> yeah. because I was thinking about some yeah. of the things that you like to do right. um, and some of the things we have in common that we like to do, mm -hmm. uh, including art, but also other than art. And, and I was thinking about risk-taking and, and mm -hmm. wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, I mean, I, for me, like not only subjectively has my work taken risks over the years, but, I mean, it goes back to the fact that I, uh, you know, I was a teenager in the 70s. I mean, um, you know, and so for me, uh, the idea of like of punk music and, and anarchy in the real sense, in the sense of, you know, holding authority um, to, uh, you know, to have to justify its own existence and that there needs to be an adequate um, justification of, of their legitimacy of authority and questioning that. And so for me, as early as in high school and then certainly in college, um, that that idea of questioning institutions and, and their legitimacy was always a priority for me. And so all the way through schools, I was doing that. And then when I first came to New York in the 80s, we certainly was, you know, in music and in art, that was very much something that um, was on the table. It's very rare to see that today. Um, so for me, my artwork definitely put that um, front and center. And then as I got involved with art further, I saw outside of the art world possibilities of challenging the authority of an art world, you know, and where art could actually end up. So to bring it completely up to date, this past summer, I, um, I worked uh, with a, um, a race team to have my art appear on the, um, the uh, Porsche um, race car for the 24 hours of Le Mans, and, um, which is not unusual in the sense that Warhol, Calder, Lichtenstein, um, and um, other artists, uh, including Jenny Holzer even, um, participate in BMW's um, art car program. And uh, so I did it, instead of using dots and stripes and decorations like that, I put paintings on the car, like even though they were images that had been uh, put on with foil and all that. But it ended up, um, you know, there's 450,000 people that go to that, that event. And, so, and then it's broadcast to millions around the world. So the idea that art could appear in that space where these guys are literally risking their lives driving at over 200 miles an hour around the track um, was something that was melding those two aspects of, of, of uh, you know, thought together. And um, I'm happy to say that our car won, which no other our car, <laughs> and, you know, both Le Mans and the World Championship, which no other our car, and that means Calder, Lichtenstein, Warhol, all these people, <laughs> Their cars didn't win a single thing, <laughs> but our car won, and um, it was. But it was amazing to see the level of preparation and the dedication and all that went into it. It took me months of work to deal with this thing because it was going from like 2D to 3D, back to 2D, and then to get it onto the car, and then to do it, um, and all that stuff. So it was, yeah, it was interesting, and it was also like. There was a lot of risk involved because, like, what if it looked bad? <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like, it was like, what well. if, what if, all these things, and um, and it ended up there was a special moment where, when they rolled the car out for the first time, and they took the cover off of it, and there were these 
characters, you know, that, around the track that are these old officials and so forth that have been at Le Mans for, you know, years. And they, they applauded when they saw the car <laughs> because it was something different. It yeah. was something unusual. Um, there was imagery in the car, and it was imagery that took into consideration the car itself and, what, and how you could see it and see it from a distance and that speed. So, yeah. So I want to ask you to describe um, the imagery on the car, but first I have to ask if sure. you saw um, Ford versus Ferrari. I did, yeah. I did see the... And you know what? I was pleasantly surprised because, um, you know, motorsport films can be really boring. I mean, uh, the original film, Le Mans, um, had no script. It was like, uh, you know... Uh, Steve McQueen just wanted to make a film about his racing, and then they and then they the Hollywood studio realized halfway through that there was no script and that someone had to come and write it. There's a lot of beautiful scenes, and what was amazing is that one of the drivers in that film, uh, Derek Bell, I was sitting with him watching the start of the race with my R car going across <laughs> the start finish line, and I was sitting with Derek Bell, who's a five time Le Mans winner, and we were um, we talked for like an hour about. His experiences. Uh, he was a five-time winner, but he also did a lot of times where he did not win, and or worse, you know. Yeah. And uh, again, it goes back to like this extreme uh, risk taking. And and that film, I think, adequate. I thought they did a really good job with it. I mean, you know, motorsport nerds will complain about accuracy, but I think as a film, it was. I think they did a really good job. Yeah, I liked it too. Um, and you drive a Porsche, right? I do. I have, um, you know, that's uh, NYC SC 911 or something like that, um, Instagram. But yeah, I have a, a 1982 SC that is kind of like a, it's an evolving artwork for New York City. It's like a Porsche 911 that's built to drive around New York City. I drive it every day. It's outside somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So... Um, I think that's all important context. Yes. So, uh, and what I was talking about in terms of, yes, of course you want it to look good, right? Mm, yeah. Um, but you also had to think about the aerodynamics of it, like all mm. the different negative impacts that it could have um, on the car, which could, as you said, with people driving at those speeds, mm. prove extremely problematic. Yeah, I mean, the... the, the um the way that the art gets <clears throat> covered onto the car, I mean, the, the old version of um, uh, of how they did it, like there's a funny video on YouTube of uh, Andy Warhol just like coming up to the car and just like painting it in this very like bored and casual way. <laughs> um, well, we did it, I was working with like the literally the best people in the business um, putting it on so that there was no problem about the arrow work or anything like that. The main thing was, was how to get the images to get onto the car. So I used three paintings of mine. One was um, Spectrum, which is well, was on the invitation, uh, was on the, uh, yep. yeah, which was on the right side of the car, and on the left side of the car was this painting Scout. So they're basically, and then the rear of the car there's this painting Riot, and so those are three paintings of mine that have made it made it, you know, I like what I like to say they made it outside of the art world, like they graduated from the art world into popular uh, discourse, um, being on Gossip Girl, and um, and the other one. Uh, made it into like the uh, um, in like this ballet theater um, over on the west side, and so there are images that kind of get repeating themselves, and they continue to do so in a popular um, culture. And that for me was the difference that I wanted to make, where I didn't want it to be simply pop art, which of course they could qualify as, but to literally be, you know. I mean, a lot of pop art is not pop art. You know, it doesn't really actually make it into popular culture. They claim that it does, but it doesn't. It exists in museums and, and are kind of stuck in a certain level. But those paintings actually made it further out in, in the way that I was hoping to express. So I brought those paintings into service of being on the car and then to figure out how to make it onto the car and be and work at speed was a whole other issue, yeah. So I love that idea of um, like the paintings escaping the um, constraints of the contemporary art world. Um, and it's so interesting, right? Because I guess um, that's a goal, right? To, to have acceptance within the contemporary art world for, for so many objects and so many people, mm -hmm. you know, and there's that plus, right? Yeah. Uh, so... I think that's really fascinating. Um, and 
I have well, we to... have the banana as an example, right? <laughs> right. Like the duct tape banana, but it, it, you know, or you know, whatever whatever time period would have been the uh, you know the you know Boise's light bulb and the lemon, or you know. Uh, any number of different examples of that, like when a when an object can like escape and then become a part of a, uh, a larger consciousness, and I think that that's um, you never know when it's going to happen. It's like writing a pop song, and can you? I mean, there's a lot you can do nowadays to um, you know create pop music, and there's a lot of um, very smart people behind that, but it's still it has to be popular. Do you know what I mean? It, it's uh, it has to break through somehow. Yeah, but you know sometimes art. Um, breaks through because mm -hmm. it makes people angry. Yes. Um, right. <laughs> yes. And oh, it I've makes people feel mm -hmm. dumb. And well, well, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and and sometimes there are like negative connotations with yeah. work getting outside of the art world. Mm -hmm. You know. But the instances that you're talking about are works I think that like escaped because they were loved. Um, yes. And and that is something totally different. I've definitely done both. Like there's been other times when I've uh, the works of mine have escaped and were not loved, and uh, there's you know consequences to that. But I think that it's literally that negativity. Without that negativity, there's no way of understanding uh, uh, positive aspects of it. There's like a an impulse now to like live 100% positively in a terms of a media environment, and that goes back to that idea that like Han actually speaks about very well in that um, book in the sense that that sameness of positivity, that sameness of constant promoting of like of health actually, you know, flip on the flip side of that puts like it down to individual responsibility to maintain that, that uh, facade. And it's just not true, you know? So when you've done something that has made people angry, yes. Um, how has that made you feel? Was that your intention? Was it surprising? I think um, there was a level of. Uh, I mean, I, I can get right to the point. That may that would have been the uh, my uh, my foray into uh, sculpture uh, in Marfa, Texas, and um, you know what was started out as a kind of a playful critique of um, the uh, seriousness of the sculpture that exists down there, you know, the Judd Foundation, the Chinati Foundation, the um, Flavin installation, and then also um, the Chamberlain. Now, I happen to know that John Chamberlain was a pretty, like, rowdy guy, okay? I mean, we all know Correct. this. You yes, know? Yes. I mean, that is to say the least. So I don't think he would have had a problem when I did it. Um, but the sculpture that I made uh, that was commissioned by Playboy, you know, got into all kinds of uh, a dust up down there. Um, and I really didn't think at the time that that it really could have that big of a be that big of a deal. It was out in the middle of nowhere on the side of the road. It was for it was a artwork, but then people, um, you know, complained to the government about it, and then the federal government got involved, and then the local. It wasn't those. The, it was really the art, the um, the local art population that was the most upset about the sculpture because it was kind of, um, you know, sending up their hallowed, um, in which I understood it was intentional, but it was not, you know, something that I was trying to do out of malevolent purpose. Although in the end, it, it really carried that type of uh, signifier, which uh, I got caught out on. I think mm. I saw it. Um. <clears throat> yeah, it was. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, in in uh, Marfa, Texas, which I will say, on, you know, as a matter of record, that I've never been to. You know, I never went and visited the site, nor did I ever um, have I since gone there. Um, but the uh, plint, the kind of concrete plinths of the uh, Judd Shinati Foundation pieces, the um, the Flavin installations with the neon lights and the uh, car, the crushed cars of um, uh, of John Chamberlain factored into my sculpture, which was a concrete plinth tipped at a 90 degree angle, like the straight away, the um, front straightaway of uh, Daytona, where uh, Richard Petty raced his charger, which is what I placed on top of the, the plinth, um, his 72 charger, which would have been the uh, his winning uh, car. Um, so I had a black example of that, and then I had a very large pole with a neon Playboy bunny emblem on it. And it was... Um, there was really a kind of, you know, if we have abstraction, we have realism, 
and I, I could even take it a step further and say it was contemporary c- capitalist realism in, in essence because it showed um, the commercial aspect boldly behind it, uh, behind the. Uh, That's the, what made people so mad. Yeah. But uh, so they 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 um, so the claim was that it was an advertisement, but in fact, advertisement has been used in art for you know for millennia. Uh, you know whether it's in, and in particularly in American art, if we go back to Stuart Davis or you know with the Champion painting, I mean it's it's literally American as American can get. And so my sculpture was meant to be very cheerfully American, um, but the federal government and the local population saw otherwise. And so uh, you know some things followed from that. So um, so yeah, and in a lot of ways the sculpture uh, became a um, a function of its own demise. And so it didn't last very long, but it sure lasted a long time in terms of the, um, the way that, uh, you know, from NIMBY issues, you know, not in my backyard issues to like, and, you know, but I, I felt like in terms of my own, um, uh, relationship to art and challenging authority, which I always felt it was, was important and challenging the legitimacy of what people thought was a certain way. Um, that, that it was a successful artwork and that it did, I mean, it didn't make people necessarily happy. So, but, you know, what was hilarious though is when I ha- was in the Federal Department of Transportation and I gave a, a lecture, 45 minute lecture on um, art and advertising and my own art and that particular sculpture. Um, at the end of it, the, uh, the employees of the Department of Transportation said, oh, you know, we love the sculpture. We go out and take selfies with it. And, you know, our family has a great time, just that it's in violation of this particular law. And, and, uh, and uh, so we got to take you to court over that. So, um, but we avoided all that, thankfully, and uh, the piece was uh, moved at that point. Yeah, it's interesting because I had read about it and then we went down to see it. Mm-hmm. And um, like most works of art um, that somehow negatively make it into the public media. Mm. Um, the the impact and the energy is so different than what's communicated. Yes. You know, um, and that's from, you know, Maurizio's Banana, mm-hmm. which just happened in Miami last week, to, um, you know, Chris O'Feely's um, Black Madonna, you know? Yeah, you know, I made a painting um, in tribute to... His painting uh, it was uh, my painting called "The Blessed Mother." That was in my has been in a number of different shows. I mean, if I show that painting today, I, I mean, I'd be utterly crucified. But at the time, you know, when I was, I think I was in. Um, I remember reading the articles and the posts and all that, and how our dear friend Rudy Giuliani wanted this thing taken down or burned or on, on whatever. Um, you know, it's it's literally. That as like when art appears past the within the confines of the art world and it makes and it like literally graduates into life, you know, like on the cover of the post with the banana and all that. Um, you never know what form it's going to take. It could be it could be great, you know, like or like with the, the Leonardo painting. It's like it's usually assigned to um, to value. Yeah, that. Salvador Mundi. Yeah, Salvador yeah. Mundi. It's usually assigned to like some type of absurd uh, value being placed on art and like some type of uh, commercial exchange. I think to Chris's credit, it was, uh, you know, his work was challenging on a much deeper level. And, um, you know, I also thinking back to like the great show that you guys did in, in Aspen, which was an amazing show of Chris's work, who I'm a big fan of. Yeah. So, yeah, it was great to, to have that painting there. Um, so let's, let's circle back to the, mm-hmm. um, gossip girl thing yeah. for a minute. Um, and, the maybe talk about because your your painting almost was a character in that mm-hmm. um in that series right because yeah. it it was seen all the time as as people were coming into the home mm-hmm. but then it it actually had a very significant role um right because multiple people wanted it and yes. then there was something and there were different reasons why multiple people wanted it and then mm. you actually appeared on the show as yourself yeah um, a couple of times yeah. yes it was fun I mean I would say as an artist that was probably one of the most fun things that I've done in New York City and I've done a lot of different things in New York City because I've been here for a while but um, the whole way it came about uh, our production fund um, and the same people that were upset with me with the you know the piece in uh, Marfa, they um, had invited me to um, be involved with the show. And originally I was asked to like 
make a nude portrait of Kelly Rutherford, uh, which was going to cause a scandal on the show. And I was, and then when they asked me to do it, I said, well, I guess I'll, you know, I mean, at the time I was like, sure, I'll do that. But then Warner Brothers um, at the time, there was an issue about uh, owning the copyright and I couldn't surrender the copyright. And they, they couldn't do it without owning the copyright and I couldn't surrender it. So we ended up with this compromise, which is to have uh, my Spectrum painting on the show. And um, so when they installed it, I went over and I uh, visited the set and watched them filming. And I was like, this is great, you know, wow, a painting on a, t on a TV show. Um, and then I said, so when's my cameo? You know, <laughs> and they said, uh, we'll send you over to wardrobe and we'll get you fitted out for next week. And I was like, really? <laughs> So, see, the answer to every question yeah, you don't so, ask is no. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> yeah, that's I mean that is that is the truest thing. So so it ended up that they they put the painting on the show and then it ended up yeah, becoming this character it was on every episode there. I ended up appearing at this cocktail party, uh, you know, like appearing as like this as myself um in the in a good um, suit. Oh yeah, and a, a Vivian West suit, Westwood suit, which was like really like fitted and kind of kind of cool. I mean, I was like, I think I kept the jacket, but um, you know, it was one of those things. Um, and at the end of the like many you know episodes later, when the series was concluding, the entire plot shifted on the the auction of the painting because the identity of Cosmic Girl was stuck in the back of the painting or something like that. And anyway, so I got a, a chance to appear on the show again, which was really fun because that show, I mean, you know, Sonic Youth played on the show and like, you know, you had uh, my dear friends, Elming Dragset from Marfa. Yeah. They were uh, very much prominent on the show. Um, Aaron Young, um, uh, Marilyn Minter, um, Jessica... Craig Martin, there was a lot of great art in the show. And so uh, Christina Tonkin, who was the set designer, um, you know, had contact, um, um, you know, um, uh, what was it, um, our production fund, and they worked together to put together a really amazing group of work. So as, I, but I, I felt pretty cool about that. And it was also the fact that there were so many people seeing it every week. It just, the paintings had a chance to become, Art well, that was more than than you know itself. You know, can you talk about your Lindsay Lohan work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that was that was a lot of this. I mean, it's uh, unrelated, but somehow no, it, 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 it's it is related. it is actually related yeah. because it it does talk about um, media and the idea mm -hmm. of um, the way that people show um, themselves in media, and so. Uh, the way that, that the Lindsay Lohan project got started uh, was I had done a series of paintings for Y Cube in London called um, Most Wanted, which was started from when Stephen Gann from um, Visionaire, um, uh, or from, I guess it was from V Magazine at the time, asked me to do um, a series of pastel drawings of young male actors. And so then I did the flip side of that and created the female actors and then did this big installation of, of um, these images of uh, actors and um, musicians in London. And, and the thing about that was that they were, like, I always thought that they could have been just like abstract white paintings, but then what do you need um, for the legitimacy of art? Well, you need a um, luxury sponsor and you need a, uh, you know, a celebrity to endorse it. So, so each painting had a luxury sponsor and a celebrity, and that was the way it went around the, uh, around the, uh, the show. So at that time, um, I was asked to participate in Two by Two, uh, which is a big philanthropic event for AMFAR in Dallas, Texas. It benefits the Dallas Museum also. And uh, so I was asked, you know, strongly, a firm ask, <laughs> you know, uh, which we all know about, uh, to uh, contribute. So... I was thinking to myself, what am I going to do? I'm working on all these actors. Oh, well, I'll do the antithesis of all these actors because at that time, Lindsay was um, facing charges of uh, grand larceny and, and, and all of that. And there was this amazing image of her in the newspaper of uh, where she looked like an Edvard Munch painting with her head thrown back in this dramatic pose. And it was in canny. So I, I made a, a large painting of that um, Edvard Munch painting, which ended up on a friend's cell phone as a screensaver, which ended up on a photo shoot with Lindsay in LA. And she saw it and said, this is amazing. Who is this guy who'd made this? And so the next thing you know, I got a text from her saying, hey, it's Lindsay. And I'm like, 
hey, <laughs> you know, and then we started and I was being coached about how to text with her, which could not be more than like four words. Like, so what's up? And it's what she said. And then I, and then so I, and then I, and then I wrote, <laughs> then I wrote like, Hey, it's great to meet you, blah, blah. And then my and then I didn't hear from her for like two weeks because I wrote too many words. And my friend was like, What did you do? And I was like, I don't know what I did. And was, so at any rate, we got back in touch after two weeks, and it was decided that um that maybe we should do something together. And then at that time, that just as that happened, and, and this is where I kind of want to talk about serendipity a little bit, because it really has a big function uh with my work, was that as that happened, when we got in touch. Um, Neville Wakefield asked me to be involved in this short film program in Venice that he was doing with Dasha. Um, and I said, yes, right? I've never made a film. I didn't even make an iPhone film. I had no idea what I was doing, but I said, yes. And I said, well, I think I might have an actor. So I had just been a judge in a surf film festival in New York with, um, with, uh, where I was able to meet the uh, great filmmaker Taylor Steele, who has that, um, HBO documentary, uh, The Momentum Generation. He's the, like, literally one of the greatest um, for surf um, uh, cinematographers of our time. And uh, I had the pleasure of meeting him, and we, you know, really hit it off. So I texted him. I said, hey, do you want to make a film with me? Because <laughs> I had no idea, you know, he was the only person I knew that might be able to And he said, sure. And at the same time, a friend of mine, um, uh, who is uh, um, Ryan um, Miller, he has a record label called Deus, had been in touch with Sasha Gray and said, you should work with her somehow. So by, by luck, I was able to be in touch with both actors and we were able to um, cast, these, uh, cast them for these films that I um, had to like, conceive of and make within 10 days after even understanding that that was a possibility. So we literally flew out to LA um, we put together a production team, like got you know, like everything set up, and then we shot a film with Lindsay in Malibu. Um, at this, uh, it was funny. It was at like, one of the um, the uh, locations for Entourage, you know, which <laughs> which uh, was this uh, like um, mansion with an infinity pool looking over the ocean, and we were able to uh, shoot her there. And I storyboarded the, the film on the way to L.A. Um, you know, because I really had to come up with a scheme really quickly. And uh, so I came up with the idea of uh, using Godard, um, you know, uh, and um, oh, now I'm going to uh, forget the other one. But I ended up storyboarding it and uh, we shot the film and uh, it was amazing. I mean, she was out on bail, uh, so that was a bit of an issue. Uh, so we didn't know whether she was going to show up, but we did know that she was court remanded sober and... Um, so we kept our fingers crossed, um, and um, yeah. So uh, we ended up. She ended up showing up exactly on time and did every shot um, in the first take, and it was an amazing experience to work with her. And then from there, I ended up making paintings of those um, of some of the film stills. I mean, basically, the storyboard. I just what I told the, my co-director was, as long as I get these shots. You can, anyone else can do whatever they want, but I need these shots. And so once I got those shots, those were the ones that we pretty much um, focused on for um, creating the paintings. But the paintings were created the way that you would create like a magazine cover in the sense that we were, um, re, you know, use, like really assembling them from many different pictures and so forth. So surfing, race cars, celebrities, TV, mm -hmm. is anything... Does anything make you uncomfortable in um, art? Is there anywhere you won't go? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, that's a, that's a, such an interesting question. Um, I think it goes back to um, an experience I had at art school, uh, which was when I I went to Yale and um, I. Uh, Two weeks into the program, I had filled my studio up with art. Like I thought I was like really on it, like a precocious art student there. And I, I had a studio visit from the um, the artist Mel Bachner, who is a great conceptual artist, very important artist, very much a you know took epistemology and art to the nth degree, and then ended up becoming a neo expressionist painter too. <laughs> so I really appreciated the different roles he had. Um, he was um, he came to my studio and he opened the door and looked into my studio. And he looked around, and he was like, hey, Richard, can you um, define the word conventional to me? 
and and I came up with some bad uh, definition, and he said, "Well, um, you know," he he looked at me and he said, "Well, um, you know, conventional is what giving in a set of circumstances what anyone would naturally do." And he said, "When you've understood that, have me back to your studio." And without having ever taken his hand off the door, he closed the door and walked out of my studio, and that was my first studio visit, and and I was, and so. I literally threw out everything that I had in my studio and started again and pushed it as hard as I could um, and then held a school-wide critique like within like a few weeks after that and I mean like sculpture, every, like photography, everybody there and um, I stood in the middle of the pit which is what they had, like was not similar to this except a bit bigger and I had all this artwork around this space and like I stood there with my arms crossed and like got ready to defend myself. So. I would say, I mean, give, you know, given the circumstances, there's probably nothing that I wouldn't do in the sense that if I could maintain the rigor of, um, you know, uh, challenging, uh, like institution, like what the uh, you know, people assume is power, and then challenging what people, um, you know, what institutions claim as legitimacy, and then actually holding people account to. Um, you know, describe their legitimacy. And so, for sure, I would do whatever it takes to do that, you know. What do you dream about? Oh, you know, I, I haven't remembered a dream in years. Like, I, I typically don't remember dreams, but I'm taking this literally. It's not like I'm thinking about, oh, what are my dreams? And mm -hmm. <laughs> But I dreamt that I was, like, in this kind of alpine situation, you know. Maybe it was because <laughs> of this, it's, yeah. It's Although I, 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 I only, <laughs> but I only... Um, you know, have been to Aspen in the summertime, but uh, at any rate, so yeah, it was this kind of strange, like um, being in this kind of alpine situation, not skiing or anything like this, but being like in some kind of critical climbing scenario in deep snow, and um, and then realizing that there was a gap between my technical capacity to get from point A to point B, um, and uh, and the fact of getting of uh, like what I would have to do. So I was like at this kind of precipice of having to decide whether it's possible to do it. So that was uh, I think that's kind of like a pretty good metaphor for making art right now, um, and also like what the um, the stakes are in terms of what the consequences can be for taking certain positions. When you're surfing, mm -hmm. does that feel like a free, does that feel like freedom? I think so. I mean, <laughs> well, not if there's like a hundred people out and like trying right. to like, right. and that's usually the case. I mean, it's been funny um, watching the, uh, the pipeline masters in Hawaii because, uh, you know, a lot of, you'll interview a lot of the surfers just like we're talking and they'll say, you know, and they could be uh, relatively going to win the world championship or doing this or that. But to a person, they will always say, well, I'm just so happy to be out here with just two other guys out, you know, and, <laughs> and surfing these incredible waves. So I think that there is uh, a place in surfing that a, a sense of freedom exists in the very way that I kind of, we started talking about in the sense where you're, you know, with yourself. Um, and, and this, you know, I've definitely been on these kind of solo missions where it's been big days out out east uh, in the winter time when there's no one else out and um and it's just you and the and it's like if something goes wrong there's nothing that's going to save you so there's there's that i would say um there's and and that is a sense of freedom because i think freedom has to do with um in the sense of like what are you willing to risk you know and you feel it the, the closer that you get to pushing that limit and i think that like race car drivers talk about it like they want to be in situations that where they are pushed to the limit and where they are operating on that limit where the consequences are ultimate and so i think that there is a sense of um of, of freedom in that in that moment and i think there's an interesting connection between that and where the conversation started where you were talking about punk music mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and and that anti-authority stance yes and i still go out and see shows all the time as a result too and there's and and i i really believe in that i've seen some amazing things recently yeah and does that space feel free yeah i mean recently um i uh went to see a band 
uh, like it's a duo. They're from Melbourne, Australia. They're called Hate Rock. Um, it's just a um, Janine Standish and Nigel Yang, and they make this really beautiful. I mean, unlike their name, their music is very beautiful and melodic and 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 quite, uh, you know. Um, I mean, it's also can be quite menacing in lyrical form, but this, their most recent music has a lot to do with their own kind of uh, story, and it's, it's beautiful. It's electronic and guitar music. But before that, they, they invited a, uh, a performer to come on uh, ahead of time, and so my, my friend Aaron and I walked into the, uh, the show, and, and I have to describe it to you because it was so... You know, I, I've seen a lot of performance art, and I go to see all number of different types of art forms. But this performed by this artist, uh, Dream Crusher, was was absolutely astounding. Um, where it was a uh, you couldn't see anywhere into the room; it was all fog. Uh, and then there was one strobe coming on, like going on and off and on and off. And you literally it lost all sense of perception. And then the volume of the music um, went way, way, way up. And then the performer started. And it literally, like, it was the most astonishing and the most kind of that. There was actually real freedom in that show. I, I was astounded to see they actually, uh, they actually performed in um, um, in uh, Miami uh, at Basel, which I was able to make it to, but. Uh, it really reminded me of the types of performance art that I saw at Mass Art when I transferred there from my final year of undergrad, um, like on the level of like Throbbing Gristle or Psychic TV. It's interesting. So can you, can you describe one of your paintings, what it looks like? Just any one of them. Oh, um, that's in the studio right now. <laughs> I can describe the painting that I finished the day before yesterday. <laughs> um, what does it look like? It's... Um, it's a dual portrait of the same person seen twice. It's a, a woman looking at herself um, uh, in an irrational, an irrational sense. It doesn't make sense rationally. There's a very large portrait of, um, of a woman looking down on, a, on the same, on herself, laying in front of her. Um, and it's in a kind of almost Caravaggio as kind of dark space and there's a kind of a glow of light and that very that sense of Caravaggio light and um and it, it's there you know there she is she's nude laying in front of the of the the face that's much larger than you know it doesn't work scale wise but it works lighting wise and um and it it's irrational it, it it's a uh, it's an irrational almost dreamlike painting in a certain sense that and it's a an idea of this kind of reflexive, reflexivity of the self and the sameness of the self in an erotic situation, which um, is non it, that doesn't reference any anywhere outside of it. So it's a uh, there's a mood of and a psychology within the painting that's um, that's really palpable. Um, but then the you know it it's a very it's a it's you know it's an irreconcilable image in a way, and this is something I'm excited to say that it is functioning now as an unreasonable painting. What colors does it have? It's, um, well, I mean, it's like naturalistic um, flesh tone. Um, it's like burnt sienna and, you know, yellow ochre. And I mean, it's, it is a, um, a Spanish, it's like a, um, a Velazquez palette. I mean, it's ultra reduced palette. And, uh, and for me, the technical, I mean, I went, the first thing that I did in, 2019 is I literally got on a plane and I went to Venice um, by myself and I for the sole purpose of well for a dual purpose one was to see Albert Owens show at the uh, Palazzo Grassi the other was to see the Tintoretto show at the Doge's Palace mm -hmm. and that had a profound that seeing those two things in tandem had a profound effect on me and um, so it really you know made me commit that much harder to my drawing and to my and to my painting and technically to try to pull off things that um so that i could create convincingly irrational paintings you know and in, in a way that um that the realism of it um it was so, it is so palpable that you can't divorce yourself from the fact that it's uh that it's a flat surf you know a flat surface and yet that there are people there you know are you are you thinking when you're painting um, yeah, I mean, in a way, the, the process is very, um, 
unerotic. You know, it's like the imagery can look erotic and it can look sexualized, but it's actually very difficult to do. And it and there it's almost like a architectural in a way, in the sense that you have to build up an, an armature and then work on um, create like creating the surfaces and creating the structure all the way up to in, in order to get the effect to really work. So um, I'm thinking about. Uh, literally creating the best type of circumstances so the best outcomes can happen. But when you're in the middle of painting, it's so dependent on touch and the, and the absorption of sensitivity that you can't really, I mean, that's the real time nature of it. And that's the kind of surfing aspect of it or the, you know, whatever it's like, you, you know, you hope that it works out. And then of course, if you screw it up, you had better have a plan, you know? And so over the years, since I've been doing this now for, uh, you know, a fair few years, um, a lot of the time you're in damage control and, and you're just fixing things that you screwed up. And so a lot of times the paintings become like the sum total of acceptable results in hopes of a, of a kind of miracle. Is that like life? You know, uh, since I've um, gotten to this point, um, yeah, it really is like that. I mean, it really is like you are the capacity to uh, make uh, grave errors and then try to dig yourself out of it. Um, yeah, I mean, the consequences in painting can be more or less not as uh, intense, but they sure can be intense too at the same time. I mean, I've definitely made paintings that, you know, in retrospect, of are, you know, turning point paintings for sure. I mean, but I guess in a lot of ways, um, you hope to be able to get to that point where you are making turning point paintings, you know. What do you still hope to do? Well, I'm, you know, I'm very much in the present with this body of work and I'm hoping that, I'm cautiously optimistic that the power of these paintings will be to uh, look at our contemporary, um, I think, I don't know, I think painting has a unique uh, possibility as a way of communication. Um, and I and I believe that, like from what I was beginning, what I began talking about at the beginning of our talk, I feel like I can challenge that with these new paintings. And it's and they're going to be disruptive, and they're going to be problematic, and they're going to have uh, you know, they're going to attack certain um, assumptions that that where of where art has got gotten to right now. And and so I think that. Um, my short-term goal is to, um, yeah, is to once again, uh, you know, uh, hold uh, this idea of domination um, to account and to say, well, if this is a dominant idea, then you have to prove your legitimacy with that. And I want the, I want, my hope is that these paintings will do that, but they will do that in a powerful way in terms of using the medium to its maximum extent. And that's why I did go to Venice because rather than go to like socialize at the Biennale, I went to look at paintings to, you know, because, you know, you're standing in front of uh, a Tintoretto where you've got like Socrates and, you know, um, and, uh, you know, Plato in the same painting, you know, it's like you, they're creating these realities that you believe in because of how they're done. And, and so I, I really wanted to look at like well, how that actually could be possible and then do it myself, you know, really come back and put pressure on myself and do it. So my, my goal is, is to advance the idea that, um, that realism can be really a powerful method in, 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 our, in our time right now in the sense that it's not a retreat into um, stripes and dots and patterns, but to actually, you know, put images out there that cause, uh, cause some shit, you know. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, I guess I don't even really then have to ask you about um, if you think art has power or where that power lies. I do. I, I do think art has power. Um, again, I mean, I would go back to that performance that I went to, which was so shocking. I, I literally felt completely, you know, it was like I felt like, oh, my God, painting is so dull. <laughs> you know, like I wish I was doing that. You know, I wish somehow... And in a way, I am painting because I'm not a pop musician, you know, or whatever. But it's like, um, but I also have a great appreciation for the volatility and the difficulty of that. But um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I do believe in the, in the power of art. I mean, it's interesting. I, I, I think that the debasement of it in that, again, in that transference from uh, leaving the art world into 
the real world, like we have, you know, with the with uh, Maurizio's uh, piece, you know, I mean, I'm more interested in a way in the in the fact that his piece was stolen, you know, and and the, and that kind of uh, that kind of action, but it's somehow less important in a way, right? Um, but I feel like, um, yeah, I mean, I remember his piece with like the donkey and the chandelier and on Green Street, you know, and. and I do believe in that, and I do believe in its disruptive power and its way to like drastically think differently. I saw an exhibition um, um, this summer by uh, you know Ed Atkins, you know, in, in Dusseldorf. It was called Old Food, yeah, I saw and this was too. one of the most <laughs> radical shows I've ever seen. And he is a truly, truly <clears throat> radical artist. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, this was one of the most radical and most far out there shows that I've ever seen. And I was like, and, and when I have experiences like that, then I know I'm in the right business, like in the right business or in the right creative endeavor. Um, you know, I've spoken with him about his work and, and, and it's for real. And so not everyone is out there, um, just self-marketing and, and, and debasing themselves, uh, for, commercial intent but there are some thoughtful artists out there that are just tearing it up i mean that show was utterly crazy so when when art um and your art in particular mm -hmm. um makes it out yeah do you think it brings people back with it i do i mean i i do think that, yeah i mean for sure i mean like, i got inv invited to be a guest artist at you know, at a high school, <laughs> you know, I've done that twice now. Um, so, and that was purely as a result of my work being on the show. And, and to me, I, like I jumped at the chance. I said, you know, I mean, I'll definitely do this. You know, I want to um, be a part of um, uh, that discussion. I mean, I probably should have edited the images that I showed to the high school students um, <laughs> a little bit better when I got there. But, uh, you know, I do believe that, um, I, re I mean, that's also why I appeared on the um, reality TV show, um, The Work of Art, um, because I, I, if I'm asked, I really do feel like it's important to, um, to get the message that art is a, 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 a language that is, is important and can be used, and it's not just about facts and figures of, of obscene um, you know, uh, price escalation. I think we, our own markets, um, are the beauty of that is something to be admired too, but in somehow it's not beautiful, but I guess when we tie the two together, it's somehow that creates another kind of art. But, um, I, yeah, I am, I'm all for it. You know, it, the way that it happens is often unintentional and not in the best way, but, um, I, I definitely think that, um, there's way I'm more interested in how it does it in a kind of subversive way, but, Again, that's a that's a tricky thing because most of what is deemed alternative or subversive is already um, enveloped in a, um, a purely commercialized endeavor. Thanks for working on behalf of art. Thank you for uh, making that possible <laughs> tonight. Yeah. Thanks. Conversations About Art is part of Art. This episode was recorded live in front of an audience at Spring Place in New York as part of a program partnership between Heidi Zuckerman and Spring Place and in collaboration with Life Water. Special thanks to Lauren Taylor and Melania Brookmeyer. Simon Illa is our producer. Sound recording of this episode was done by Kimberly Gonzalez. Our theme music was composed by Eric McDougall. Jordan Weisberg is our curatorial associate. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and review us on whichever platform you listened, as it helps us further our goal of connecting all to art. We'll be back again every Tuesday with new episodes. Thanks for listening.